next weekend, want to give you a little nickel tour of the car barn. Uh, just want to prove to you it is happening. Construction is fast and furious. In fact, uh, this will be future stage. Um, they just buried a time capsule for us right beneath the altar today. And so you can begin to see what was just a little garage is turning into uh, this event venue. We'll have some risers on either side, uh, which is gonna be so fun because it's a large space, but it's also intimate. We'll be worshiping with each other and actually towards each other. And so um, next weekend, we'll do a little bit more of a walkthrough, give you a sneak peek of how it's beginning to take shape. But uh, just wanted to give you a quick uh, look inside. In 2008, uh, four students set out to revolutionize the eyewear industry. Uh, they were neck deep in student loans. They had no background whatsoever in eyewear or e-commerce. Uh, more than a few friends called them crazy. But they couldn't get over how much it cost to buy a pair of glasses. Their idea was pretty simple. Offer fashionable frames at a fraction of the price and do it online. A decade later, uh, Warby Parker is a billion dollar businesses, I bet some of you are wearing their frames. Now Adam Grant writes about Warby Parker in his book Originals uh, because Adam Grant was offered the opportunity to invest. He declined and he said this and I quote, it was the worst financial decision I'd ever made. Now I want you to hold that thought. In the world of economics, there are two kinds of cost. An actual cost and an opportunity cost. Now, an actual cost is an expenditure. It shows up on your balance sheet as a liability, and it's relatively easy to account for. Uh, an opportunity cost is a hidden cost, and so it's far more difficult to account for. It's the loss of potential gain. It's the loss of potential gain often because of indecision or inaction, enter Adam Grant. Failing to invest in Warby Parker did not cost him a single penny in terms of actual cost. Uh, no harm, no foul, but it cost him millions of dollars in terms of opportunity cost. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Now, Luke 14, Jesus tells a story about a construction project, not unlike uh, the city block that we are constructing right now. And he said this, don't begin until you count the cost. And that makes sense, right? And we get that. But I think sometimes we fail to realize that it is a two-sided coin. I, I think most of us, pretty good at calculating actual cost. Uh, calculating opportunity cost, not so much. Why? Because it involves scenario planning and systems thinking. And when you try to account for the future, far more variables involved, spiritually speaking. It is a moral calculation that involves a measure of faith. When it comes to your future as an individual, your future as a couple, uh, or even our collective future as a church, counting the cost is so critical. I want to talk about both sides of that ledger, but I might spend a little bit more time on opportunity cost because I think that is the hidden cost of Christianity. Listen, you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. Goodness is not the absence of badness. That is a glass half empty gospel. That's why at NCC we talk so much about wanting to be more known for what we're for than what we're against. You can maintain the status quo, and there is no net loss. But the opportunity cost, ah, that's staggering. If you stay in the boat, you will never walk on water. If you stay in the boat, you will miss out 
on the miracle. Last week, I said, if we're going to reach people no one's reaching, you got to do what no one is doing. Now, we do some things as a church that are admittedly maybe a little out of the box, but that's because we're trying to reach people who are out of the box. Listen, we are not going to stay in the comfortable confines of the sheep pen. We're going to risk the 99 to go after the one. Why? Because that was Jesus' risk-reward ratio. And so, welcome to National Community Church. Uh, Thrilled to have you here uh, this weekend. All seven of our campuses, a little shout out to our extended family. We are in a series called Yes and Amen. And if you have a Bible, you can turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll get there in just a moment. Two weeks ago, talked about two trains. Uh, So far, so God. And the best is yet to come. Remember, God is coming at us from two different directions. God's faithfulness, pursuing us from the past. God's sovereignty, bearing down on us from the future. And so those two realities, those two theologies meet in the middle of a place called the promises of God. And as the children of God, that's where we live. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. But uh, that's not the end of the verse. You've got to flip this coin. So through him, the amen is added by us to the glory of God. In other words, we have to add our amen. Last week, cast a vision for our uh, next chapter as a church. If you missed that message, maybe uh, uh, you want to go back, you'll find it online, uh, or you can subscribe to our podcast. Uh, Listen, we're attempting to do what we've never done before. We have turned a crack house into Ebenezer's Coffee House. We have turned an abandoned apartment building into the D.C. Dream Center. We have never turned a 127-year-old car barn into a prototype campus, child development center, and mixed-use marketplace. This is a God-sized vision, and we would not have it any other way. Can I tell you how God grows us? And how God glorifies himself. He gives us a vision that is beyond our ability and beyond our resources. Because then, when God does it, we can't take credit for it. Show me the size of your vision. I'll show you the size of your God. My God? Able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. So here's what I know for sure. God's vision for this church, bigger than ours. And God wants us to be a bigger blessing to this city. George Bernard Shaw said, there are those who look at things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. This is a why not church. This is a why not vision. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 7, here we go. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So week one, we got pretty theological, right? Uh, Week two... Uh, We got pretty logistical. Uh, It's week three, and we're going to get financial. I want to put some numbers to this vision, and I want us to talk about the part that each one of us can play. Now, let me say this up front. I know that money, a sensitive subject, right? can be a little awkward. Um, Not as awkward as sex. We could talk about that. Um, But we'll stick with money uh, this weekend, okay? Um, Here's the deal. You need to hear this up front. God does not need your money. Okay, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns the hills. God does not need our money. But here's the deal. Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. And those two things 
go together. And so it may seem like we're talking about money, but what we're really talking about is what's happening in our heart. And so I want to talk about how to grow in the grace of giving. And we'll hit on four levels of generosity. And listen, I figured out it's going to take two weeks, okay? Um, and so week one, we'll, we'll talk about level one, level two. Uh, and then next week, we'll talk about level three and level four. But let me give you these up front because I know that we have some note takers. And so you're going to want to write these down. All right, here we go. Level one is giving spontaneous. Level two is giving consistently. We'll talk about those two. Uh, level three is giving proportionately. And then level four is giving radically. Let me say one more thing up front. Uh, I know that uh, some of you uh, may be in a tough spot financially. You're trying to get out of debt. Uh, trying to make ends meet. Um, I, I totally get that. Listen, Laura and I, we have been there and done that for many years. Uh, when, when I was in graduate school, Laura brought home most of the bacon. I worked a little side job at a storage facility. But listen, I remember pumping $2 a gas. Anybody else part of that $2 club? Because that's about what you could afford, right? We ate so many waffles those first few years of marriage. Unbelievable. Um, listen, I'm not complaining. Uh, life is lived in, in seasons, and that's true financially. And so uh, when we moved to D.C., I actually worked a couple of jobs for several years because uh, one job didn't cut the cost of living. So if you are in a tough spot financially, I know that, that growing in the grace of giving, that feels like, ah, uh, I might check out until next week. Um, and, and you're here and you'd love to give more, but it's just not the reality of where you are this weekend. I just want to acknowledge that. I want to empathize with that. I want to share my prayer for you. Listen, it's 2 Corinthians 9.11. It says, you will be enriched in, in every way. Why? So that you can be generous on every occasion. Just a little reminder right here. God does not bless us to raise our standard of living. God blesses us to raise our standard of giving. Having said that, let me say this. I think there are ways to be generous that have nothing to do with money. Okay? Can I tell you something? Just being real. More difficult for me to be generous with my time, with my money. Every weekend, hundreds of volunteers. You get up early on Sunday morning and you invest your time and talent in this thing called National Community Church, that is generosity. And I, I want you to hear me say a huge thank you. When it comes to finances, I think we can fall into a, a false narrative. We think we'll be more generous when we have more money. I am not buying what you're selling. Listen, if you aren't generous with a little you will not be generous with a lot. I think what I'm saying is, I think generosity starts right here, right now. And so with all of that said, let's jump into the first level of generosity. It's giving spontaneously. And, and Paul, in this passage, in 2 Corinthians 8, he spotlights the spontaneity of the Macedonians and, and the way that they are giving. It says in verse 5, uh, this was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. Like, do you love that as much as I do? Like, that is just pure generosity right there. I'm giving spontaneously. If you're looking for a little bit of a definition, I, I think it's spirit-led giving. It's about being in touch and in tune with the Holy Spirit. And there are moments, listen to me, when the Holy Spirit will give you one of these. 
got a sharp elbow and will nudge you because of a need uh, that is in your ability to meet or because of an opportunity that out of the corner of your eye you may spot and you feel prompted to do something about it. Well, the first level of generosity is just obeying those promptings. And when we do that, oh man, can can I just say this? If you're not having fun financially, dial in right here because what you will discover is that there are some divine appointments waiting to happen. A few years ago, I read a book by Bruce Wilkinson. You were born for this. Tells a story about speaking at an event in Johannesburg, South Africa. And so late one night after a speaking event, he and his son David uh, wanted a snack, found a restaurant right as it was closing. You know, that's the worst moment for the servers, right? Because you're trying to clean up. And, and uh, so he, he did a little begging, uh, said, is there any way you could find some ice cream for two guys who would really appreciate it? And, you know, probably cringing inside, but the, the server smiled and said, let me, let me see what I can do. And so she found some ice cream and uh, Bruce and David enjoyed it immensely. And as they were eating the ice cream, he just felt led by the Holy Spirit that that he needed to leave a rather large tip. In fact, he he had a wad of bills in his pocket and felt like God was telling him to leave all of it. Now, sometimes you just kind of do this on the sly, right? Uh, But sometimes you feel like you probably ought to communicate what's happening. And so he said to the server, you were so kind to find us that ice cream when the kitchen was closed. Appreciate your extraordinary service and just want to leave a tip that reflects that. And so um, left the tip and they tried to get out of there before she could count it or catch them. You know what I mean? But uh, they weren't, they, they didn't do it in time. And so she caught them. She said, you know Jesus, don't you? Bruce didn't deny it. She said, this is a miracle. So I have a baby, and we couldn't pay rent. The landlord was going to kick us out of our apartment tomorrow morning. I prayed to God on the way to work just this afternoon. Please, God, send us the money, or we're going to be living on the streets. She wipes away a tear and she said, sir, this amount is exactly the rent I owe. That's how I knew that you know Jesus. Church, would it not be a wonderful thing if people knew that we knew Jesus because of our spontaneous giving? Because of our generosity, because of the way that we respond to the needs around us, the opportunities around. And that does not mean leaving a gospel track that looks like a fake bill. Please, please do not do that. Uh, Let me go back to what I said at the beginning. If Bruce Wilkinson doesn't obey this prompting, There is no actual cost. In fact, guess what? Still has a wad of bills in his pocket. But the opportunity cost, pretty high. Uh, One, he misses out on this miracle. And two, she might end up on the street. Not every instance as dramatic as this. But listen, I I think spontaneous giving is a game changer. It will put some fun back in your finances. And I, and I think what I want us to understand is that uh, our gift is someone else's miracle. I, I believe that. I actually believe that. And uh, that's pretty exciting to be a part of. Now let me get practical. Bruce Wilkinson keeps some cash in his wallet in a place he calls uh, the God Pocket. He says the God Pocket is a specific location in your wallet or purse where you keep money you have devoted to God so you can give it to someone in need as soon as God nudges you to do so. Pretty simple, pretty practical, 
pretty powerful. And the parable of the, the good Samaritan. It's a man in need on the side of the road. Uh, two religious types, the priest and the Levite. Uh, you remember, they, they walk right by. They ignore the need. Why? Because they have places to go and things to, to do. Listen, listen to me right here. It, it is our religious routines that sometimes cause us to miss divine appointments. It, it is our religious routines that sometimes cause us to miss the miracle that is right on the side of the road. Why? Because we're so busy doing God's business. And getting where God wants us to go, that that we miss these opportunities to make a difference. Spirituality is spontaneity. It's it's a spirit-filled, spirit-led life. And I think that includes the cash in our wallet. Can I suggest that the Good Samaritan had a God pocket? It says the next day, took out two denarii and gave them. To the innkeeper, a denarii was a day's wage. In today's dollars, based on median income in D.C., this is $594 before taxes. What that tells me is this. The Good Samaritan had created financial margin so that he could be a blessing in situations like this. Listen, spirit led does not mean poorly planned. Au contraire. I don't think I've ever used that in a message. (laughs) Growing in the grace of giving involves some budgeting. And that budgeting then allows you to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit without even having to check the balance on your checking account. Just for good measure, Good Samaritan could have ignored this need and and walked right by this divine appointment just like the priest, just like the Levite. He, He could have saved $594 in actual cost, but he would have missed a moment. He would have missed a miracle. In 2 Corinthians 9-11, Paul outlines some giving guardrails. It says, each one of you should give as he has decided in his heart. In other words, this cannot be outside in. It's got to be inside out. Uh, and then he says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, listen, during this series, we're challenging you to add your amen to the vision that God has given us as a church. No apologies for that. Uh, But the last thing that we want is for you to make a pledge for the wrong reasons. But what are the wrong reasons? It's anything that is not prompted by the Holy Spirit. This is about each one of us discerning, saying, God, what what do you want me uh, to do? And then we follow the Spirit's lead, and guess what? When we do that, uh, some miracles happen. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Can I tell you uh, the mindset of a cheerful giver? They, They do not give because they have to. They give because they get to. It is not an obligation. It is an opportunity, and they have counted the opportunity cost. All right, let me switch gears. Uh, First step in this journey of generosity is giving spontaneously. I pray, may God give you a moment this week with your time, your talent, your treasure, just to seize that moment and see the kind of difference it can make in someone's life. But if you want to continue to grow in the grace of giving, there is another level. And I think it's giving consistently. Now, the the key to growth in any area of our lives is establishing consistent habits, regular routines, daily disciplines. Uh, Consistency beats intensity seven days a week and twice on Sunday. Over time, you become what you do day in and day out. Aristotle said we, we are what we repeatedly do. This is not rocket surgery. Okay. Uh, how do we give consistently? Well, every week we take an offering 
And if you're new to this thing called church, um, I often wonder what's going through your mind. Because it's a little strange, right? Like you see this popcorn bucket coming down the row. Is there popcorn in it? I can't even imagine the letdown when you discover it's not actually popcorn. And then you're wondering, now do I put something in or can I take something out? Um, You know, what is happening up in here? And so uh, let me reverse engineer this offering idea all the way back to 54 AD. Paul is writing his first letter to the church at Corinth. And he sets a precedent. He says, on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Now, in keeping with, uh, that sounds like proportionate, doesn't it? And so we'll get to that next week. Uh, But Paul establishes a regular routine. Now, one of the ways that Laura and I put this into practice is, uh, and one of the ways we've gone from kind of spontaneous to consistent is by setting up automatic withdrawal. Like it's this crazy, uh, unbelievable kind of 2019 opportunity we have to probably do this a little bit easier uh, than folks 2,000 years ago. And so uh, every paycheck, there is an electronic transfer that goes right to NCC. Now, we still give spontaneously to lots of different kingdom causes as God leads us. But that consistent giving becomes a baseline. It becomes a trend line. And that may be the next step in your journey of generosity. Uh, Let me say one more thing uh, about the offering. Because I I want you to understand what you're doing when you give something to National Community Church. In, In all my days of pastoring, I have never seen anyone put themselves in the offering bucket. Now, that would be a little strange, wouldn't it? Probably break the bucket. But every time you give, that's exactly what you're doing. There's an old adage, time is money. But the opposite is true, too. When you set up recurring giving or or you put something in the offering, listen to me. You traded your time and your talent for that paycheck, and you made a decision. I'm going to give a piece of my, I'm going to put a part of myself into that you are offering yourself. This is not cold hard cash. This is blood, sweat, and tears. And here's what's so beautiful about this. You may give the same amount as someone else, but it is absolutely unique. Why? Because it was your time and it was your talent and it has your fingerprint on it. I want to say thank you. All right, let me hit pause right there, and we'll pick this back up next week. Uh, We'll talk about level three and level four, uh, giving proportionately, giving radically. Here's what I want to do. Two weeks ago, I asked you to begin to just pray uh, about this pledge card that you got, um, and just think about the part that God might want you you to play. Now, let me say this again. If you are a guest, um, no obligation whatsoever. I want to make sure you know that. Uh, This is for those of us that this is our church home. But what I'd like to do, a couple of minutes, is just walk you through that pledge process and and just talk a little bit about how Laura and I approach moments like this. And and I want to make sure that you uh, hear my heart. And so uh, if you've got it, just kind of grab this uh, right there on the the front of the card. Uh, Actually... Uh, Yeah, right on the front of the card, uh, you'll see a box for your name, not your neighbor's name. Okay, just a little confession right here. When I was a kid, I went to a church that had offering envelopes and golf pencils in the pew. That church received several million dollar pledges from superheroes with handwriting that looked a lot like mine. Okay, this is not your neighbor's pledge. This is you. This is your name, okay? Um, I know, we love to discern the will of God for everybody else, don't we? No, this is, uh, this is us. Now, let me say this. This is between you and God. This is not a credit card company, okay? No one is going to come knocking on your door. This is about you discerning what God might want you to do. Now, second box, kind of right, right below it, uh, is this spot where you can write a pledge. I'm going to say a few things about that. First of all, uh, it is a two-year uh, timeline. We wanted to give you a long enough runway 
so that you could dream a little bit bigger, think a little bit longer. Now, you may want to give a one-time gift, and, and that is great, but, but I might encourage you to consider a monthly pledge. Why? Because it cultivates the consistency uh, that we're talking about. And, and if you make a $100 monthly pledge, for example, listen, over the next two years, that's a $2,400 gift. I think there's something about kind of in increments. It's not quite as uh, overwhelming. And so uh, I'm going to be praying for you as you pray about what, what that number is. Let me talk a little bit about how Laura and I uh, approach this. And, and listen, uh, we approach it very differently, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, we are exact opposites on the Myers-Briggs personality assessment. Let me tell you something, opposites attract. Wooka, wooka, wooka. Okay. Our approach pass could not be more different. And I don't know what it is about my personality, but I love exotic formulas. It took the Israelites 52 days to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. What if we took our annual income, we divided by 261 workdays, we multiplied it by 52. Amazing. Our money gift would equal their time investment. And I love these kinds of ideas. And so I'll unpack my quadratic equation to my wife. And she will patiently listen. <laughs> now let me tell you what Laura's spiritual gift is. It's the ability to say in one sentence what takes me an entire sermon. <laughs> I don't even, I don't know how else to say it. And so usually I'll get done with my whole blackboard presentation. And she'll say something kind of like this. Or we could just give this amount. <laughs> yes, we could. Yes, we could. And we usually do. Okay. <laughs> now, here's how it goes down. We pray about it, then we talk about it, and then we pray about it some more. And then we compare numbers and we compare notes. Uh, sometimes we're on the some, same page. Sometimes we are not. And listen, that is a healthy part of this process. I'm going to tell you why. Because you have to lean into each other a little bit more. And you have to lean into God a little bit more to kind of get that uh, discernment. Two things guide us in these kinds of decisions. Uh, and we're bringing this thing in for a landing, almost there. One is we want to make a pledge that stretches our faith. Now, you've got to do some budgeting, and you've got to count the cost, but not just the actual cost. Faith counts the opportunity cost. Now, I shared this last week. Phase one, fully funded because of the generosity. About 256 leaders who said, let, let us lead the way. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, that means that we're on to phase two. Uh, $5 million, kids ministry space. And, and I just believe it is going to be the best investment we ever make. Are, are you kidding me? That is compound interest to the third and fourth generation. We are going to disciple thousands of kids in that space. And so when we talk about doing things that will make a difference 70 years from now, we're talking about our kids. And so uh, at the end of the day, we, we want to make a pledge that has a measure of faith. And then we want to make a pledge that has a measure of sacrifice. We, we want our family to feel it a, a little bit. Now, uh, please continue to feed your children three days a meal. Uh, three, three, three <laughs> meals. I'm talking fast because I got a lot to say. Um, please continue. Three meals a day, okay? Uh, but do not tell me there are lots of luxuries that we could give up for a season for a kingdom cause. Um, and that's how you grow in the grace of giving. You stretch your faith and you make some sacrifices. Been, been so blessed, so challenged by so many that have already made a pledge, a year-end bonus. Uh, people making pledges during the government shutdown. That took some faith. Uh, someone giving a down payment for their first home. He, here's the thing. I would never ask anybody to do that. But, but I would also say, I would never tell them not to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to stunt 
their growth. And that's how it happens. And so th- this is what gets me fired up. Yes, we have a vision to build out a city block. Uh, but this is not about a building. This is about stewardship. Th- this is about each one of us growing in the grace of giving. Can you imagine a church where everyone is growing in the grace? That is a church that will turn a city upside down. And so here's the game plan. Next week, I'm going to give you an opportunity to add your amen at all seven campuses at the end of that service. We're just going to have a moment. And so this week maybe is a week where you could uh, put your name, your name, and uh, that pledge amount as God leads you. And come next weekend ready to be a part of a moment. Now here's the deal. I'm like thinking to myself, but we, we already made a pledge. Listen, we are not going to miss this moment. And so Laura and I are going to do something above and beyond that pledge. Because I want to be a part of what I think is going to be an incredible moment for us as a church. Uh, and so... I want to encourage you. Would you let God stretch your faith? Would you be willing to make a sacrifice? Would you add your amen to this vision? All right, you guys have been amazing. Let, let me pray for you. If you feel comfortable doing it, maybe just kind of grab this, put it in your hand. And, and I'm going to be praying for you this week. Our team is going to be praying for you. But grab this card. Let me pray for you. God, right now, I thank you for every person in this place God, I I thank you for their unique fingerprint. I thank you for the time, talent, and treasure that they have invested in this church, that they have entrusted to you. God, would you guide us? Would you help us grow in the grace of giving? God, we want to be cheerful givers. So we thank you for the privilege of knowing you, of serving you, of being a part of your kingdom and God we pray in Jesus name may your kingdom come may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus name would you add your amen amen Amen.